one of the the topics of the preseason has been the absence of Mitchell Robinson. Now, that certainly impacted the team in the playoffs in, in their 4-1 to one gentleman sweep against the Hawks. A lot of people think that uh, a healthy Mitch might have impacted the series or maybe even changed the series. So let's, we're going to go into the film and, and talk about Mitchell Robinson's impact on this team. Joining me tonight, my co-host Tommy D and special guest. If you guys haven't seen this guy's work on Twitter, man, you better get up on it. He is Ariel Pacheco. Uh, Ariel, how you feeling, man? Welcome to the show, man. Feeling good. Feeling good. Glad to be here. Thank you for the kind words. Been wanting to get on for a while, so glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely, man. So so let's get into the first part of this Mitch breakdown. Let's talk about his impact on the pick and roll. Yeah, so um, on this clip here, you know, what we see is that the Knicks are going to run a pistol action for RJ. So it's just a quick little, like, screen and roll on the wing to kind of get RJ going downhill. That's his strength. And, and, you know, Mitch comes over to set the screen and there's going to be a cut here from Bullock. And it's important because it makes Bogdanovich the help guy on this play and at the bottom. And it also clears the left wing. So if RJ decides to turn that corner, it's available to him. And now there's a miscommunication between uh, DeAndre Hunter and John Collins. And they don't know whether Collins is supposed to switch or get back. And so now you're going to have a situation where Bogey is left to guard Mitch on the roll. And, you know, RJ reads this. You can see Mitch point up, call for the lob. It becomes a jumping contest, and Mitch is going to win that against Bogey 10 out of 10 times. He has that elite catch radius, and what that means is that the pass doesn't necessarily even have to be a good one. It's just in the general area of Mitch, he's going to get to it, and he comes down with the dunk on a one-handed catch. Um, Mitch has elite roll gravity too, which means that he's like such a threat when he rolls. Defenses are going to collapse on him to try to prevent that lob, and that opens things up for shooters. And it helps that the Knicks have a ton of guards capable of throwing that lob this year. And it's important, in my opinion, to draw a distinction with Mitch. Like, yes, he's a limited offensive player, but he's elite at what he can do. Tommy, you know, that that pistol set for RJ was a very common play that the Knicks ran, especially to open up games. And that chemistry with him and Mitch was was very much on display all season when Mitch was healthy last year. So definitely looking forward to them running that again. And as Ariel alluded to, there's so much advantages that you can create off of that play. Because, again, Mitch alone as that lob threat, you got to respect the vertical spacing. As Ariel said, the, uh, the catch radius is superb. But also... You have options on the wing where if that help side defender has to, you know, get over on Mitch, you can imagine the guy like a Fournier in the corner, you know, a good shooter from three, good shooter from the corners and and one that uh, knocked him down. I think he was about over 50 percent from three on on wide open three. So a lot of options they can go off of that uh, off of that pistol action. And Mitch, Mitch is a big part of it. I love the elite catch radius. We got to put that into the uh, Knicks fan TV vernacular for sure. Ariel calling that. I love that. Um, And also, you know, the biggest thing for me uh, in the playoffs, not having Mitch there was certainly impacting RJ Barrett's ability uh, in pick and roll, specifically getting downhill Um, during the regular season. As we saw, Barrett created 5.4 chances per game, um, just coming off really a lot of that right side pistol action where he's able to get downhill with his strong hand. He was as good as anybody with that left hand, not only getting to the rim, throwing the lob with the other different options, um, but also getting to the free throw line. In the playoffs, that fell to just 2.8 per game, um, which certainly limited his effectiveness, especially in the half court. So they definitely missed Mitch uh, in, in that series for sure. You know, fellas, obviously a huge factor in the series against the Hawks was uh, Hawks big man Clint Capella. 13 points, 10 rebounds, and two blocks against the Knicks. That was a force in the middle for the Hawks. Uh, but we saw Mitch have some in- impact and effectiveness on him in the regular season last year, Ariel. Well, so the good thing about Mitch is that he's bulked up, what it looks like from his media day pictures. And But even last year, before he added that muscle, um, he showed that he can kind of hold his weight even against the bigger, more stronger big man in the NBA, even like Capello, who you mentioned is a monster in the paint. So here, Capello gets the ball at the elbow and tries to tap him off the dribble. But you can see Mitch's lateral quickness. He just moves his feet so well, sticks with him even as Capello makes a spin move and doesn't get knocked off his spot. And he jumps once at the fake, but he doesn't foul, which is something that he really improved upon last season. And he's able to recover and bottle up Capello with a really good contest. And he keeps both arms verticals, avoiding that foul, as I just mentioned. And, you know, the Knicks come up with the with the loose ball after. But you can see his motor, too, because he continues to fight for the board after. He's just an elite rim protector. And even when he makes a mistake, like jumping at fake, he can recover because he has that length. He has that athleticism. And overall, he could have really neutralized that impact that Capella had. 
Um, Noel was kind of out muscled in that matchup, and he was also hurt, um, given his, his due. But uh, Capella really went to pass and around the basket, and I think Mitch would have had a, a really good, um, would have really changed things for for the Knicks in that aspect. Yeah, and Tommy, you know, on the on the Mitch front, as Ariel said, that lateral quickness, man, I think that was missing there. We we know Noel was was just as much as, as an elite rim protector as Mitch was last year, but you know, to me, the lateral quickness is really what set these two guys apart. In that, you know, Mitch's ability to keep up on the perimeter against drives, not just on a big man against Capella, but against guards, against wings, and, and really slowing down those, those uh, dribble penetration attacks. And I think that's what really set those guys apart but another key point that Ariel touched on was his discipline and Tom Thibodeau talked about that in his most recent press conference this season in terms of how Mitch has come along from a player development standpoint and you know maintaining that discipline not fouling as much using that verticality you know I'm sure Kenny Payne you know got in there and worked with him on that as well and so uh, certainly that's an area where he'll be an asset to this Knicks defense. Listen, anytime you're talking about a Tom Thibodeau game plan, especially in the playoffs it, it, from a big man, lateral quickness is important. Space eating, shot contesting is number one, I think. Uh, you know, they definitely missed Mitch's 8, 9, 10, 11 shot contests. He also can contest three point shots, but we're talking about Capella specifically. I thought Mitch really, in, in this regular season game, showed his ability to stay on his feet, as Ariel pointed out, CP, as you talked about, just having uh, the, the awareness to, to eat space, not get Capella, not let Capella get to his spot uh, whenever he wanted to. Noel was not as good at that. Um, and, and certainly, again, you missed all of Mitch's minutes in the paint and specifically those shot contests. And we'll see with that, uh, you know, exercise that he put on over the offseason. You know, we'll see uh, if that helps him out even more against some of the more physical centers like a Capella, Embiid, uh, you know, Jokic, things of that nature. Mitch was really challenged last year against those guys. And, I, you know, I thought he did his best. But with that added size, I think it should hold him down a little bit more. As we said in the last sequence, Mitch's lateral quickness allowed him to maintain Clint Capella, but also against the guards. You know, he showed some impact there against the guards and slowing down that pick and roll especially with Trey Young man Trey Young went from 13.9 points per game as a pick and roll ball handler to over 17 in the playoffs absolutely shredded the Knicks on that play we had no answer for it how does Mitchell Robinson impact them in that regard well that's where they missed Mitchell Robinson the most was in the pick and roll defensively here the Hawks are going to run a double drag screen for Trey and you can see Mitch read the play early he starts to position himself to, to defend against Trey once he comes off that second screen um, Elf is going to get hit by the screen and now he's behind the play. So now it's a situation where Mitch has to play too. He's in, he has to decide whether he steps up and contests the floater or drops back and contests the lob. And most bigs in the NBA, they can do one or the other. Mitch is one of the handful of guys that you feel confident that he can do both. And here he shows that. He um, steps up to Trey a little bit and it forces Trey to take off from behind the free throw line. That's kind of an awkward uh, spot to take a floater anyway. So Mitch knows that the lob is coming. He's able to jump up and deflect it. He's going to win jumping contests 10 out of 10 times. I said that already. But it's, it just shows the kind of impact he could have had in, in a playoff series against Trey. Noel and Taj were, were solid, but Mitch is just in another on another level in that respect. Having a big who can prevent that floater lob combo that Trey utilized to pick apart the Knicks defense would have been a major game changer. Making guys uncomfortable, making it awkward for a guy like a Trey Young, you know, making him think twice. You know, is he how far away is he going to take off? Can he get the floater off over Mitch? Is he going to go to the lob? And then you see the athleticism and the agility on display where he's able to kind of play that space in between and still be able to recover and prevent the lob from going to Clint Capel to execute the alley oop. It was kind of similar to how uh, Giannis was able to do that against Aiton in, in the NBA Finals. Like Ariel says, very few players uh that can play defense that way you know the, the modern big now to me cp is when we think back to the shacks and the ewings going back in the day with, with the, the centers Olajuwon, it was protecting the front of the rim and now rim protection is still a big deal but in terms of intimidation now you what you see with mitch specifically i love that second clip there that second high part of the highlight is when he's standing on the top of the key trey can feel that a point guard can feel uh, uh, that big of a, a 
length and size at the top of the key. And that's going to disrupt what he wants to do in pick and roll. Um, and I think that's Mitch's biggest thing. It, it, when you combine that, I know I'm going to get in trouble here um, from people watching this, but when you combine that with Alfred Payton's size uh, from behind, you know, being 6'4", you know, you can feel that on both ends. And I think that is what led to, as Ariel pointed out, which was, which was really smart, um, sort of the awkward takeoff and, and really what blew the play up. Not having that in the playoffs, I mean, Trey had his way in the pick and roll. We saw 29-something points per game, 10 assists. I mean, he was he was unstoppable. Uh, the rules have changed, and obviously the point guard situation for the Knicks has changed as well. But one thing that needs to be the constant that is such a plus for them is the intimidation factor of Mitch Robinson at the top of the key, engaged and prepared and waiting for that point guard to arrive. And as a, as a point guard, you can feel that, and and that's a big that's a big bonus for the Knicks for sure, and something that they missed in the playoffs. Now, Ariel, in this next segment here, that this was a, a Mitchell Robinson staple in his rookie year, man, and that was the uh, the contested three in this game against Atlanta. He contested eleven shots, three of those at the three point line. Uh, what what'd you see here on the film? Um, so first, it's just another example of how good Mitch is at positioning himself in the pick and roll. Cuts off Trey here, forces him to pick up the ball. And it's a subtle thing, but he sticks out his arm to kind of prevent that short roll to, to Capella. And now they're forced to reset up top to Reddish. And Capella's gonna screen for Reddish again, and he thinks he's gonna get a decent look at the three, but Mitch just covers so much ground with his length and leaping ability. And he comes up with the block. He just has this like uncanny, uncanny skill of blocking three-point attempts. He's very comfortable defending out on the perimeter. He's just the ultimate like safety valve. He can cover for so many mistakes from other guys, even his own mistakes. When he gets healthy and returns, he's going to be a big part of the defense, just as he was last year when he was healthy. No, no question, man. And, and Tommy, once again, you know, just his ability, as Ariel said, to cover ground, using the agility, using his wingspan, his size. It's almost like he, he kind of moved around in almost a triangle, like, you know, hedging against the drive against Trey gets his arms up to kind of prevent Capella from getting the pass and then jumps out into the three-point line to, to block a Cam Reddish three-point shot. And what I love most about it is disrupting the two-man game and forcing them into the third and, and sometimes fourth. In this case, it was just a third option with Reddish, who you want making decisions. Uh, Reddish certainly, come playoff time, was not really in the rotation. Um, you know, But any time that you can cancel out a pick and roll against the Hawks, which – Robinson did pretty consistently in that one game and, and does consistently night in and night out. Um, you're relying or you're forcing the other team to have to rely on their third and fourth and fifth options. That's a win for your half court offense night in, night out, possession in, possession out. Um, and certainly something that they, they, they lacked uh, during that uh, gentleman sweep, as you mentioned, uh, against the Hawks. And then here, what you love sort of talking more, uh, diving deeper into that shot and test factor um, that he's that Mitch is so great at. Just watch him against Dame here. I mean, he already knew, and this is sort of engaging with the point guards we talked about with Trey, just being able to sort of say, hey, here's your lane, go for it. We're talking about probably the best point guard in the league, arguably right now, Damian Lillard, um, saying, okay, here you go. go, go take the lane and being able to then uh, basically contest on the pull up. Damien made the smart play here by pulling up because he knew he was going to get a shot blocked at the rim and he didn't have any kickouts. Another advantage to Mitch is guys can stay home in the corner and then the Blazers here reset and D Damien, the great player he is, says, I'm going to make uh, an adjustment here and go left. And it really didn't matter as Mitch's lateral ability there on display, uh, being able to, uh, to, to make that. But to be able to stick with the guard and allow for Alec Burks and whoever's guarding in the corner to stay home is such a huge advantage for the next one having Mitch Robinson in the lineup. Yeah, and Ariel, that, that's the foot speed, the lateral quickness once again on display here. The wingspan, you know, Mitchell Robinson forcing Dame into a tough mid-range shot. As Tommy D said, Alec Burke's allowed to stay home, you know, not allow that corner three to the easiest three in the game. And again, just impactful team defense is what Mitchell Robinson is going to bring to his team, man. Yeah, you can just see how comfortable he, he is on the perimeter and like switching onto guard. You can, you can, it kind of looks like he's like inviting it, like he, he wants that challenge. And you can see like he's up at the level as soon as Lillard comes off that screen because you know Lillard can pull from, from anywhere basically once he's past half court. But an another thing is that he kind of stays low once Lillard is like driving at him and he stays low and keeps his hands up. And, and like it's like a what that does is it allows for him to leap pretty fast. And so he can like it, it just he's able to react really quickly. And 
You can see that once Lillard pulls up, he's just like up at his face and he just misses the block. He contests the shot literally as, as about as well as you can without getting a block. And it just shows like his lateral quickness coupled with his leaping ability. He has, he's very quick to react. He's kind of underrated as like a, as like a, I don't think he gets credit enough for, for being a smart defender. He's just, uh, he's really underrated in that aspect. And just overall, he, he's the perfect center in, in today's NBA that you want defensively against these kinds of guards like Trey and Lillard that are dangerous in every aspect of the, on offense. Big time, big time. And and uh, his, his presence is going to be missed, man. We're hoping uh, he gets back on the court soon. He's They just showed uh, when the Knicks were playing against the Wizards, he had a, a pretty hard jog that he was going there. He he hit me on the gram, said he did 10 down and backs in 56 seconds. So, Block Ness Mons is ready to work because this is going to be a big year for, for him, contract year. And, uh, you know, big expectations for the Knicks. So, Block Ness Mons is certainly going to factor into that. Absolutely. It's it's definitely a big year in terms of contracts and, and what the decision is going to be moving forward from the front office. Uh, he's definitely due for a big contract. He has to prove that he's going to be able to stay healthy and be the factor. And we can talk about it all we want about how he could have been a factor and they may have beaten the Hawks had he been there. The reality is he's going to have to play in a playoff series if he's on the roster, if they don't make any decisions before then, which you know, we, we don't see coming, um, but he's going to have to uh, prove that he is the postseason uh, uh, player and an impact guy that he is during the regular season for sure. It's easily this this year's easily the best crop of guards he's ever played with in his NBA career as well. You know, he's got IQ, Burks, Rose, Kemba. There's just a n- numerous guys that, that are capable of throwing up lobs and creating easy looks for Mitch that if he is healthy, he's going to have a really big impact. And he's going to be able to showcase his skills like an elite roller and lob threat. And I also think that the biggest concern, I guess, for the Knicks this year is probably the perimeter defense. RJ is going to be that main guy this year who guards the opposing team's best uh, uh, wing wing guys. But Kemba and Fournier, you know, the greatest, the strength aren't on the defensive side of the ball. So having a guy like Mitch who can cover up for their mistakes and deficiency is going to be essential. Um, so it's just about staying healthy for him. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that and certainly covering up for uh, Kemba and Fournier. And then on the offensive side, you know, playing with two dynamic point guards for 48 minutes, more uh, ball, uh, more playmakers when you talk about Fournier. You're adding IQ, who's in, in, you know, year two developing as a point guard. RJ's prowess as a playmaker. So Mitch is going to benefit from a play development standpoint and playing with all those playmakers. And then on the, on the other hand, um, another area where he was big for the Knicks was offensive rebounding. 88th percentile in offensive rebounding percentage. He's going to get them a lot of second chance points. Maybe that works into some more three point shots, which Tom Thibodeau has been advocating for this year as well. In, in Thibodeau's uh, most recent press conference, when he talked about IQ using the floater, he talked about the fact that, you know, he likes the floater as a way to get second chance opportunities over a mid range in terms of the misses, you know, getting, getting easier um, offensive rebounds off a floater rather than a long mid range shot. And that, you know, you have to factor in Mitch in those opportunities. And again, maybe that gets you more three point shots as well. So going to be interesting to see how he factors into the overall improvements on the offensive side as well. Fellas, great job. Ariel, great job on the breakdown. Tommy D as well. Looking forward to the next one. And uh, for you guys in the chat, man, leave us a request. Is there any type of film breakdowns, any game breakdowns, any player break- breakdowns that you want to see? Leave a comment in the comment section below and uh, we'll get back to you, man. Knicks Fan TV Court Vision. We out of here. Peace.